subversive, strange and stunning stuff now on fall from some of the world's most creative animators in Dope Sheet. Welcome to Dope Sheet, Channel 4's invocation of animation. On Dope Sheet tonight, we uncover the secret history of German animation. We reveal the animator who discovered Christopher Walken. But first, we discover the feminine side of cartoons. I love the vamp images in animation. I think that the pneumatic contours of so many of the voluptuous uh, female figures in animation um, are they're coming from some principle of, of a natural fertility. The interesting thing about the body in animation is the fact that it's possible to stress things that are important for women. I don't have any problem with the portrayal of women as being beautiful and sexual. Mm -hmm. But you want to get the full range of women uh -oh. so that women are not ghettoized into um, evening gowns and lingerie. The thing about animation is that you can exaggerate. I mean, it's not just voluptuous, it's humongous. The first movie I ever saw was Walt Disney's Snow White. Slave in the magic mirror. It had the most devastating impact on me. In particular, the electrifying persona of the Witch Queen. Let me see thy face. What wouldst thou know, my queen? Who is the fairest one of all? That elegant, bitchy dominatrix looking into the mirror, sweeping around with her fabulous costumes and so on. I thought she was amazing. I do think that the uh, Witch Queen is a, a kind of supreme example of a willful woman. She, she is pagan woman, um, and she is the, the anti-Mary, the anti-type, uh, no doubt, of, the, of uh, the mother of Jesus. Now, begin. In the beginning, taking on a character like Jessica, you know, I did get a lot of reaction from female friends of working on such a overtly kind of male-designed character. You know, she was quite controversial. I think one of the reasons why I, I wanted to be involved in Jessica after reading the script and seeing the final designs was the fact that she did have a personality and she was quite strong. Why don't you do right? I guess the... Um, the, the nightclub sequence has to be the highlight, really, of Jessica. It was, you know, a beautiful song. It was fantastic. Get out of here. Get me some money, too. Jessica Rabbit was uh, really a combination of uh, male kind of ideas and fantasies of how this uh, sexy woman should look. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. I think it's one extreme or the other. We've, we've, we've got the Jessica and the Betty Boop. Now we've got the Lara Croft, which is the other extreme. There's lots of possibilities for something in the middle. As a kid, I remember watching Betty Boop and thinking, I wouldn't mind being Betty Boop. I guess in the same way, maybe I've been programmed, I also wouldn't have minded growing up and being Barbie. So I'm, I guess I'm a product of that that generation. Everyone is pregnant. I think the idea for everybody's pregnant definitely occurred while I was in a doctor's office with like my feet in the stirrups. And I just had this feeling of uh, being like in a meat market, you know, being run through these doctor's offices with sometimes like as many as 30 other women there at the same time. And I assume that the film will be of interest because there's a certain universality in experiences like coming to terms with not being able to have children. And he called me from the waiting room and said, I should get pregnant, 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 ooh. Bonjour. That means hi. 
Uh, Mrs. Henri Matisse. I went to the Matisse exhibit, and halfway through the exhibit, you know, after looking at pictures of Matisse's wife, Emily, like, you know, in a kimono, swimming, you know, by the lake, you know, eating fruit, halfway through the exhibit, it said that Matisse moved to the south of France by himself. And, and I just thought, what happened to his wife? I used to be his model, then I was in the way. Girls, they get fat, girls, they get gray. I tried to look up what had happened to, to him and to his wife, and wasn't really able to read anything about it, and I just made up the whole thing. After it was shown in the New York Film Festival, I got calls from people in the Matisse family, and what I was told was I hit the nail on the head. No, Henry. No. But I, I do think that the things that I find the most interesting are the events in my life that have shaken me to the very core. Something that I think a lot of feminists have brought up, this whole idea of handmade cinema, and they're absolutely right. I mean, women can make films on the kitchen table with two kids screaming. Vera Neubauer, I think, is, um, she's often um, butterflied or butterfly pinned as a feminist, um, as a subversive filmmaker. What you can call Vera is an experimental filmmaker. Her latest film is called La Luna, and it's quite a departure from what she's done up till now. One of the things I really like about this film is the way that she uses wool, for instance. There's something iconic about that, and she's made these wonderful little figures out of this wool, and she deconstructs them, and it is this, this literally a string running through the whole film. Her works are extremely um, tactile. You watch her films and you can feel them, you can taste them, you can smell them. One frequently hears the accusation that uh, there is a, um, a sexist vision of woman projected by male animators. The men had no trouble with their women in them days. I think that what you're getting in um, the world of cartooning and animation is the, is the primal id. You, this, this is the reality of the sexual impulse. Uh, this is the reality of male sexual desire. I would defend um, animation to the, to the limit against the charge of, um, of uh, sexism. Oh, yeah? That's what you think, sister. Next on Dope Sheet, we look at one of the pioneers of abstract animation, Mary Ellen Butte. Between 1935 and 1956, she created 15 abstract films in collaboration with her husband, cameraman Ted Niemer. Butte then moved on to live-action film, winning the Cannes Prize for Best First Feature in 1965. Her rich and varied life and works have been unjustly ignored. When I met Mary Ellen, she was making films that were different from the films that other people were making. But she thought that they could be popular, and she had persuaded the management of the Radio City Music Hall to try out one of her films and almost all of them did premiere at the music hall. So that meant 18,000 people seeing these little five and six minute handmade abstract films. You just have to imagine what this looked like when it was 50 feet across, at least, in this immense theater. Film artist Mary Ellen Butte combines science and art to create seeing sound. Mood contrasts. To be working for an experimental filmmaker, it was like a dream come true. One morning, she just showed up with an aquarium full of black coffee. And then we had a, a big pitcher of hot of um, cream, and uh, we just poured the stuff and turned on the camera and uh, saw all these wonderful 
flowing patterns developing. Abstronic. I think you have to get beyond some of the, um, well, the kitschy coolness of it. Um, I think once you get beyond things like those titles. A Seeing Sound Film by Mary Ellen Butte. Enjoy yourself. Once you get past that, she really does some amazing things with uh, movement and, and uh, form and color. Um, so I think her stuff, the heart of it is quite pure and quite beautiful. She came from a wealthy family. She spent uh, every nickel she could borrow from banks, her relatives, her friends. It all went right into film. At a party for the American Film Institute, I asked who this woman was. She had a large hat on, and she was sort of going around and greeting everybody. She had gloves on. She's a very southern lady. And uh, <laughs> she came up to me, and she said, Hello there, how are you? Do you all know where I can get some money? <laughs> Why the flick has lost his false teeth? Half the choir's on the floor looking for them. Heard it. Remember where you are. She had done a short film, which she produced with live actors. She hired a 14-year-old boy named Ronnie Walken, who grew up to become Christopher Walken. And she did a story that she picked partly because it told so much about herself. She had to live in a world where she could not really express her true visions. But even if it was happening, and you did see it, not through a wall, of course. I did see it through a wall. Oh, silence, Ernest. You have disgraced your mother by talking aloud in church about false teeth. Mary Ellen attracted very talented people and encouraged them. <laughs> Thelma Shoemaker uh, worked on Finnegan's Wake with Mary Ellen Butte as a very young person. It was her first job after school, and Mary Ellen encouraged her, and Thelma went on to become an editor for Scorsese. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never done this before. <laughs> so the fact that I actually even edited on that movie is, is quite astonishing because it was, I would have known very little about how to do it. And I think I was paid $45 a week, as I remember. I think Mary Ellen chose to do Finnegan's Wake because it really captured seeing sound. James Joyce was, was very musical and liked the sound of words. So it was a natural for Mary Ellen Butte because she was interested in seeing sound. I remember being very shocked because John F. Kennedy was uh, shot. I heard about it while I was at work. Silent! She seemed to be very annoyed with me that I um, didn't seem to be able to go on working. Yeah, yeah. I remember that being a very shocking experience, something I've then found out later on in the film business that your personal life gets easily uh, shafted when you're old. So it was a good, sharp beginning. <laughs> At the end of her life, she lived in a one room, in one room. Uh, she spent all of her money on her films. She was living in a Salvation Army home for single women. She developed cancer the last few years of her life. Well, she died in a hospice not far from the residence hall where she had lived. She was a most unusual woman and an unusual filmmaker, way ahead of her time. Mary 
Ellen belongs to a group of artists who are simply not recognized. We've yet to see a breakthrough on abstract animation. It has to come. And I feel that when the thing turns, all of these wonderful artists are going to be discovered. And they are discovered each year by a few more people. And it's suddenly going to be everybody. After the break, Dope Sheet hits the road in search of the dark truth hidden in the forest of early German animation. Claudio Ravenstein, otherwise known as Fibs, is an animator, a punk, and a man on a mission. He's writing a thesis about animated Nazi propaganda. Fibs has come across the story of one distinguished German animator's subversion of Goebbels' directive to promote the final solution. I'm half crowd, half spaghetti. I thought I might as well do something positive, you know, to go like, do some animation, you know. I went to Auschwitz recently to find out why my grandmother, who was half Jewish and an artist, had to be gassed there in 1944. Well, that was the reason I went to Auschwitz, was because of my grandmother. She was a famous artist in Germany. Hitler was loving Mickey Mouse. Hitler was hoping that Mickey Mouse is going to help him to exterminate the Jew. In Franz Leberecht's Arme Hansi, Hansi the Canary is driven out of the farmyard with violence which so passes Disney's more extreme moments. Bullying and persecution are glamorized, presented as the honest code of peasant life. For Hansi the Canary, the message is clear. If you don't belong, get back in your cage. Goebbels was really clever. I mean, for propaganda, he was, he was a genius. We must admit that, even though he went the wrong way. I was joined by my mate Buffy from college. We drove like madmen to Berlin with a single cassette Motorhead. What I'm planning to do is go to Berlin, search around, you know. They are gonna get these films I'm after, you know. I, I know I'm gonna get at least two, three. The first thing I looked for in Berlin was information on Hans Fischerkosen, the animator. Fischerkosen was apparently sent to the Sachsenhausen concentration camp but I couldn't find anything on him in the archive. But I did find out that many German artists had to flee the Nazis, including animators like Oskar Fischinger and Lotte Reininger. However, many animators remained working in Nazi Germany from 1933 to 45 under Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda. Many of these films had the wrong date to suggest they had not been made in Nazi Germany. Many more have been re-edited or destroyed or simply disappeared. I discovered some films that had been featured in a documentary, including Kaufmann nicht Händler, a film made to celebrate the first German day of trade in 1933, a government initiative designed to create anti-Semitic feelings amongst German traders. Another discovery in the archive was Hochzeit im Korallenmeer, animated by Horst von Möllendorf. 
featuring identical creatures juggling, perpetuating the Aryan ideal of teamwork and unified identity. I'm determined to get to the root of this. I found proof of the existence of Nazi propaganda in animation. But now I'm trying to understand why those animators would do that kind of work. Goebbels had paid Disney good money for Mickey Mouse shorts and the Three Little Pigs, but balked at the cost of Snow White. As a result, he called for all able animators to step up production and focus on commercial cartoons that stuck to the Nazi code. Hans Fischerkosen, one of the most distinguished animators remaining in Germany, was called into action. Fischer Kosen's first film under the Nazis, Weather Beaten Melody, seems harmless enough on the surface. However, the film actually contains quite a bit of subversion. In this case, the ambiguity of the worker bee's reaction to the liberated hedgehog's enjoyment of crazy jazz, a kind of music which was actually forbidden by the Nazis. After the war, the Russians tried Fischer Kosen as a Nazi collaborator. He was imprisoned at Sachsenhausen, now a Soviet camp. Whilst there, it is said he produced murals in a place where drawing, reading, writing and singing were banned. This must be it. Buffy and I decided to try and find these murals. There's no traces of Fischerkosen here in, in Sachsenhausen. I don't know why. I would have thought that maybe the, f the graffiti should have been preserved there, really, like on the walls. So I, I don't know what happened to that. A similar spirit of ambiguity and subversive subtext pervades Fischer Kosen's second film under the Nazis, The Snowman. Our hero is trapped in a dark, hostile environment, Winterland, and discovers another place which is sunny and free, the country of summertime, July. The snowman escapes there at the cost of his own life, but it seems that freedom and happiness are worth dying for. Execution trench in Sachsenhausen, and uh, just up here is the crematorium. This is where 100,000 plus people got put to death. But Fischer Kosen was very lucky when he was here that, to know that he was not one of them put on that wall. Right? Yeah. It's a shame we couldn't see them, the graffitis of Fischer Kosen. I couldn't find the original murals from the kitchens, but I did find photos. They illustrate the humility and tragedy of the vegetables of the same family helping to slice each other up. <laughs> Whilst the silly goose seems to satisfy Goebbels' command for blood and soil films, that glorify German peasant life. Fischer Kosen also creates a complex and ambiguous story that often confuses and contradicts Nazi policy. When the goose is seduced by the fox, we hear an old Yiddish song. It seems at first that the fox, the villain, is identified as the Jew, but then we discovered the goose, the victim, is being abused in the same ways as the Nazis abused the Jews. Slave labor and imprisonment ending in execution. Why do you think Goebbels used uh, Nazi propaganda in animation? I, d I think it's got something to do with uh, the innocence of animation, and uh, because of its innocence, it's it's more insidious.
Reynard the Fox is a perfect example of this. Propaganda disguised as innocence. Although the soundtrack has disappeared, it's clear from this surviving fragment that the cartoon rhino is intended to portray a cunning, manipulative Jewish caricature. Fischerkosen demonstrated that even in the darkest hours of human depravity, men of principle can resist by subverting with subtlety the orders and prejudices of a tyrant. I think Goebbels realised that the way to really brainwash people wasn't to shout to them and drill it into their minds. It was to work on the prejudices and bigotries that already existed in their society. It really isn't a question of did it contribute to the final solution. It was, it was one of the building blocks to, to brainwash the populace into a kind of dull acceptance where they wouldn't, they wouldn't raise a voice. I don't think his spirit got crushed because he managed to escape from East Germany shortly afterwards, didn't he? Across Just with his camera. I found this letter which was uh, written to, to my grandfather. In the letter he said that your wife died uh, today in Auschwitz on a natural course. And um, she died at such and such time. And that, that was all my grandfather ever had of, of his wife. He knew that people who went to Auschwitz never come back. Ordinary people say it will never happen again and ignore the Nazis. But ordinary people help to kill other ordinary people by spreading Goebbels' message. I wish it wasn't just me saying this. I wish my grandmother was here to say it as well. Dope Sheet will be on again this Sunday. We'll be showing some of the films featured in tonight's programme after the break in Beyond Dope Sheet. In fact, you can see more from Dope Sheet tomorrow on 4 at 5 past midnight.